In the beginning, the Earth was at the centre, with the Moon, Sun and other wandering stars circling around it. The wandering stars, or planets, were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. These planets could all be seen with the naked eye from Earth, moving against the background stars. This model of planets had a few minor problems. For instance, it struggled to explain why planets would move in the wrong direction across the sky, retrograde motion. Starting halfway through the 1500s, a century of astronomical drama started, sometimes known as the Copernican Revolution. Copernicus introduced the heliocentric, sun-centered model, which explains away pesky things like retrograde motion at the cost of demoting the Earth to just another planet orbiting the sun. The Earth had one object orbiting it, its moon, boringly called just the moon. Galileo, who turned the newly invented microscope to the skies, saw that planets and the moon weren't pure but had blemishes, moons in the case of Jupiter, and even ears. Wait, what? Oh, not ears, rings, which weren't visible when the rings of Saturn were seen edge on, and they're beautiful. The four Galilean moons of Jupiter were evidence of astronomical bodies, definitively not orbiting the Earth, but something else. A big win for the heliocentric model. Eighty years later, Isaac Newton, building on the work of Kepler, discovered the law of universal gravitation. This tied a nice bow on the new model of the solar system, explaining why planets orbit the Sun. The same force that pulls apples to the ground keeps the Moon in orbit around the Earth, and the Earth around the Sun. Isaac Newton also saw that the gravity of planets would affect each other, and in the long run having a destabilising force on the solar system. The solar system could not stay eternal, and it would eventually break apart. Newton realised this, and thought about it for a bit, then posited that God just occasionally comes along and tweaks things to stop this happening. Phew, nearly had another profound insight there. Close one. Hold on to your hats, the age of planetary discovery is about to begin. In 1781, Uranus was discovered by William Herschel using state-of-the-art telescopes. It was the first planet to ever be discovered. All other planets have been known from the time we were like monkeys or something. Herschel hadn't been the first person to see the object, but he was the first to realise it was a new planet. Uranus is an ice giant, as we know of it today. The hunt was on for more planets. The tightest Bode law was a mathematical curiosity that said there were predefined distances from the Sun where we would expect to see planets. Uranus happened to fit very close to where the law predicted. Interestingly, it also said that there should be an undiscovered planet between Mars and Jupiter. And on the 1st of January 1801, Ceres was discovered, pretty much exactly where the mathematics predicted. Ceres is the Roman god of agriculture. The solar system had the second new planet in 20 years. Then in 1802, Pallas was discovered in the same region of space as Ceres, Pallas being an epithet of the goddess Athena. Juno was discovered in 1804, also in the same region of space. 1807, Vesta, ditto. These planets were starting to become annoying. There were many of them, and astronomers kept finding more of them, a total of 10 by 1849. We now know of over a million of them, although the vast majority of them are tiny. The total mass of these objects is only 4% that of our moon, with the largest four accounting for nearly half of that total mass. Ceres is the most massive. In the 1860s, cool moon planets fell out of favour, and they were referred to as asteroids of the asteroid belt. The tightest Bode law is just a coincidence, and the law has no explanation for why planets would form at these specific distances from the Sun. But another technique, a much more scientific technique, astronomers have used to search for new planets, is by looking for the gravitational tug of these hidden planets on the orbits of known planets, shifting their orbit just a little bit. In 1843, the Verrier predicted Vulcan using this technique, a hypothetical planet that orbited very close to the Sun, to explain peculiarities in the orbit of Mercury. Vulcan being the god of fire, and being so close to the Sun, was a good fit. Le Verrier, or anyone else, never did find Vulcan, but it wasn't until Einstein could the peculiarities in Mercury's orbit be explained. In 1846, Neptune was discovered. This was also predicted by Le Verrier, although he wasn't the first to actually see it. 
and the Verrier saw deviations between Uranus's orbit and what was predicted mathematically, and suggested that there was another planet tagging on it from afar. Still more peculiarities in Uranus's orbit suggested that there was another unknown planet, Planet X, that was disturbing it on top of Neptune, the search of Planet X was on. And in 1930, Pluto was discovered. Astronomers had predicted Planet X in roughly that region of space that it was found. It soon became apparent that Pluto, named after the classical ruler of the underworld, was tiny and had a strange, wonky orbit that sometimes meant it was closer to the Sun than Neptune. It was so tiny it could have no impact on the orbits of other planets, and the more astronomers learnt about it, the punier it became. With time, astronomers became confident that there was no anomalous source of gravity influencing Uranus and Planet X officially died. Although the hypothesis has recently been resurrected to explain other phenomena. In 1978, Charon, Pluto's moon, was discovered. Unlike any other moons found beforehand, Charon is so massive compared to Pluto that they sort of orbit around each other, although Pluto is leading the dance. Charon, romantically named after the discoverer's wife, is by cu pure coincidence also the ancient Greek ferryman of the dead. Oh. The Pluto saga came to a head in 2005 when Eris, a potential planet more massive than Pluto, was discovered in the same region of space. Eris meaning the Greek goddess of strife. This, and the fact that there are likely many other small objects beyond Neptune, meant that the International Astronomical Union were to specify the definition of a planet and whether Eris counted. The proper definition of a planet is somewhat arbitrary and somewhat controversial. Intuitively, we all have a feeling of what a planet is, but it's difficult to find where the boundaries are. The Sun is obviously very different from Jupiter, and they are defined differently. But Mercury and Jupiter are wildly different, and yet the definition of planet has to capture both of these objects, while also excluding asteroids, even though Mercury is, in many ways, more like an asteroid than it is like Jupiter. Some proposed definitions would also include moons as planets, which just feels gross, Contextual cues played an important part in the definition. What the immediate orbital environment is like, as well as what the object is like in and of itself. Pluto is not a planet because it has not cleared its orbit. It shares its environment with other bodies. But it is massive enough to be round, and it orbits the Sun, which are the two other pieces of the puzzle. Curiously, exoplanets, planets which orbit other stars, are automatically excluded from the definition. It must have been tempting to grandfather in Pluto as a planet, but that would feel even more arbitrary in the long run. Although, you'll always be special to me, Pluto. All the objects which weren't planets would either be dwarf planets, like Pluto, or Marky Marky probably is, or fall into other slightly arbitrary traditional names, like asteroids or comets. Marky Marky and the other newly found non-planets at the edge of the solar system are named after creation myths from different cultures, which is much nicer than the gloomy hell-related names like for Eris and Pluto. Taking a step back, in 1877, the tiny moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos were discovered, just 11 and 6 kilometers across, respectively. They are named after Greek personifications of fear, lovely, and ironic considering their puny size. They are likely captured asteroids, there are many moons of the solar system, and in many ways they share many of the same properties as the planets. Most bodies in the solar system have moons, even Pluto has five. Moons are not planets because they orbit larger objects, their parent planet, and not directly orbiting the sun. And as it goes for moons, it goes for everything in the solar system. There are a small amount of large objects and a large amount of small objects, with the distribution being roughly continuous. There are no clean breaks where humans can draw lines and split things into neat groups. This kind of distribution is known as a Pareto distribution. Human language struggles to capture this distribution, and no doubt we will update our definitions when we know more about our solar system and others. So much has been just uncovered right now that it's inevitable, and that's what's interesting, right? And that's it. Thanks very much for watching.